Hey, it's Alex Rackle from Board Game Co. And it's time for another Games Leaving the Collection for January 2021, the first month of 2021, which has been not the worst, not the best. It's certainly been, I don't know, you know, 2021 feels like one of those times where they sat there and said, well, there's no way the sequel will live up to the hype. And and it's it's not necessarily as bad as 2020, but it's certainly crazy. Uh, I, I mean, the most recent thing is going to be the whole GameStop, Robin Hood drama and trading and how a bunch of people on Reddit are somehow managing to tear down giant uh, corporations, not corporations, hedge funds, giant hedge funds or whatever it is. It's been a fascinating year, and 2021 is managing to hold its own. Hopefully, it stays entertaining and not drastic virus destroying the world. Hopefully, we'll see how that plays out. But hey, you know, we'll see how it goes. In any case, that aside, 2021 news aside or whatnot, let's start off with what's leaving the collection. So, we're going to start with Charity Party. Charity Party, which, as you might imagine, is a party game. It's a light little party game that is not... The typical thing that shows up in my collection. The problem is, I like data, uh, as you may know. I like data a lot. I like numbers. I like stuff. And so, when I saw a party game all about charts, then I, I had to get it and try it out. And basically, Charity Party is a game where you're going to... It's kind of like apples to apples, Dixit or whatnot. It's a typical judge kind of situation where somebody has to vote on how things are going to play out. And in this game, you have a default chart that goes out. And then people have to line up the x-axis or the y-axis. For someone who likes data, I should get those down. You have to line up the y-axis, I think it is. Yeah, the y-axis. You have to line up a card with the y-axis of that data to have them correlate. So maybe you have a graph that's going high up. Uh, I, don't, I can't explain this. I'd have to pull it out. But ultimately, you're trying to match up y-axis with a chart in order to result in a funny situation. And I was skeptical that it would work. And it does. It really, really manages to work uh, most of the time. Not every single round is going to be funny. But they give you enough cards and enough charts and enough things that seem scripted to match that it actually is immensely entertaining. And I played through the entire box twice, and that was good enough for me. You know, I did it in two different groups, uh, both small groups. Our COVID, because of COVID, our groups these days, uh, the first game was myself, my wife, and someone who basically lives with us at this point. And then the second group was with the two other people who are part of our game group. And we went through the entire box twice. And, and now I'm ready to move on from it. So I do recommend it. It's just not one that I actually feel the need to stay in my collection. And speaking of party games, from there we'll move on to Don't Get Got. Don't Get Got is a party game that Shut Up and Sit Down heartily recommends. And, and I see why, honestly. I don't, I mean, I'll get into why, well, what the game is like, why I'm not keeping it, all of that. But I can completely understand the appeal of this and would recommend it depending on your particular circumstances. Uh, Don't Get Got is a game that runs in the background. It's not a game you actually play. Rather, you have these effectively these little envelopes that you're going to get that will have specific challenges written on those envelopes. And there's a whole box full of challenges. And they might be anything from, you know, pretend to be on the phone and get someone to write down an imaginary phone number or get a player to grab something off a high shelf for you or get a player to flip a coin and land heads. There's any number of simple challenges. All of these things that are just incredibly simple. They're just small little things that they was, they, some of them are going to be typical day to day interactions. Others will require a little bit more work. So like one of the cards says, get a player to throw this card out, which is intriguing. And so you have to sit there. I won't go through all the char cards, but you have to sit there and then you get there. Each player gets their own wallet and it goes into your pocket or whatever it is. And then the game just runs. What I mean by that is you're in the middle of playing your game and perhaps you ask someone to do something and then you say, you got got because they managed to accomplish a challenge that was on your card. Or maybe it's later that day and they walk past and you're like on the phone doing your thing and you're like, hey, 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 uh, Jack, J names again, Jack, uh, what's it called? Uh, can you take on the summer for me? And then you just say, you got got. The game runs in the background while you lead your regular life. And to that end, it is entertaining. I got it. We started playing it at home. And I found that my problem with Don't Get Got is either I am constantly devoting 1% of the back of my mind to the game. I'm constantly devoting 1% to how can I trick my wife? How can I get her in terms of this card or something else? Or I'm completely ignoring it and three weeks go by and we don't try a single card. So we played a few games. We had this game for around two, three months or so. Uh, kept on giving it a shot. And I think it's entertaining when it's working. I just don't have the patience to constantly have this in the back of my mind. And neither does she apparently. And so we're just, we're just not really playing it. That being said, the first game we played, in which it was front and center, and we rattled through it over the course of two days, that was immensely entertaining. 
But it, it's a cute little party game, as you might imagine, because it's a party game. And one that I think might be immensely entertaining for the right group of people, for people who are constantly around each other, or maybe they live together, or different kinds of situations. But ultimately not one that is staying in my collection, because I just don't want to be constantly on the lookout for whatever's happening next. From there we have Silver Amulet. Silver Amulet by Bezier Games. Silver Amulet is another small box, and from there after this we'll move on to the bigger boxes. Silver Amulet is a party, not a party game. It is, how do you even describe this? It's kind of a social deduction game, but not really a social deduction game. It's not really a hidden role situation. It's you have this objective in the game to basically get uh, the lowest score every single round. You can play multiple rounds, add up your score, whatever it is. But ultimately the game relies, in my opinion, based on our limited plays of the game, the game relies on too much luck, I want to say. Like, it's too much scripted in terms of whatever the cards make deal. I didn't find there to be enough satisfying depth to the gameplay as to how it plays out. It is mildly entertaining, but I'd rather play a mildly entertaining game that gives me more feeling of control over my destiny as opposed to just going with whatever the rules tend to hand out. Now, I do know that this is a line of games from Bezier Games. This is a line. Is There's Silver Bullet, there's Silver Dagger, there's Silver Amulet, there's all these different options that all combine to give you more things. And so I actually kept this for far longer than I should, wondering if I'd get more of the stuff to be able to try it out, to see whether it gives me more depth, more gameplay, more whatever. And, and then I realized that I wasn't trying to hunt down the more and so it's time to say goodbye to this because I constantly have to get rid of games because I'm constantly getting games. And so silver, silver bullet or silver, this one's just, this is just plain silver. Silver is leaving the collection because it just, it was good. It was good. It wasn't, wasn't really particularly amazing. It was just a, it was a fun, fun game with minimal feeling of decision or choice over how things played out. Now, from there, we're going to go to possibly... I'll save this one for last. Let's go from there to Sorcerer City. Sorcerer City, which is one that... I've been debating this one for a long time. Now, Sorcerer City is going to be by Druid City Games, or by Skybound Entertainment, and it's one that a lot of people like. I'm seeing this on a lot of different lists from people who are really appreciating the game. And Sorcerer City... Look at that. The box is on right in this one. Sorcerer City is going to be a real-time tile placement game. In this game, what you're doing is, in roughly two minutes, I believe it is, per round, and across five rounds you're going to be rapidly putting out tiles into a city that you're building of your own. You each can have your own little city, and each trying to accomplish certain scoring objectives in the game. And you can slowly but surely deck build, or bag build, or tile pile build, or something like that, because you're going to be constantly reinvesting what you earned in the game to buy more tiles that give you abilities or better configurations or different things. And then you'll also get different uh, abilities depending on how well you scored in the round, and then ultimately points, because points is how you win the game. You can do that across five rounds, occasionally dealing with monsters in the game, and it's a really solid game. Uh, it's really enjoyable, and and I'm not pulling it out to play anymore because I don't I don't know what it is about the game. It could be the real time. I don't think it's the real time because actually the real time part and the, the the bag building of the tiles is actually my favorite part of the game. I really appreciate. Uh, I like this game a lot. That's what it comes down to. I do like this game a lot, but it does fall into a category of being a lighter game to a degree, and one that there's a lot of competition for games in this space. It is a lot of fun. I, I genuinely recommend trying this out. Check out other people's reviews. Uh, this one has been around for quite some time. I want to say it's been in my collection for going on a year, somewhere around a year, uh, and it's it's solid. We've played it a bunch of times. We've enjoyed it every single time. I would never turn it down. It is... I don't know what it is about it that has me picking other games over this. I really like the, the real-time tile placement. It's one of the few real-time games I enjoy. I really like the tile building. I think I find the monsters a little fiddly. I think I find that part a little fiddly. I don't know. Uh, for some reason, we haven't really. no one's really been called to pull this off the shelf for a while. And my general rule when looking at games to get rid of is once I make that decision, once I say, that's it, you're going. How much am I fighting back against myself? How much am I trying to convince myself that it should stay versus genuinely sad that it should stay? And I find Sorcerer City, I'm not sad to see it go. Intellectually, I, I really think I like this one a lot more than I do, but the idea of it leaving my collection just doesn't bother me enough, unfortunately. And speaking of which, we have another one that will fall into the very same category of that, which is going to be Enchanter's Overlords. And this is one that... I don't want to, like, lift the box up because all the cards are in it. And I have a whole bunch of content for this. I have, like, basically everything up until... I don't have the most recent Kickstarter. I have everything else. And Enchanters is going to be a really solid game. Enchanters is a little game which you're kind of building out an item, an enchanted item, as you constantly go through this card row. So it's not really deck building, but you will be acquiring cards from a card row that will become your newest item. So 
So you might have an, a hammer of death blow. I don't really know, but you're going to have a constantly have an item and then an enchantment that go together to give you abilities that you have to manage. And you're going to use those to attack various creatures or monsters as you go through this card row until you reach the end, occasionally encountering dragons or whatnot. And the game is very variable in the sense that you'll constantly be shifting up different types of cards that will be u utilizing, different decks of cards, each with their own dragon, each with their own monsters, each with their own enchantments, items, etc. It is a lot of fun. It really, really is. And yet, again, similar to Sorcerer City, we haven't pulled it out in a long time. I constantly have been telling myself, I need to play it again. I need to play it again to remind myself how much I like it. I need to do that. That's what I've constantly been telling myself about this game. But again, lots of games, a little bit of time. So it's it's uh, it constantly falls into the category of hard decisions. And same as Sorcerer City, I am ultimately not sad enough to see this one go. While I like the system, while I enjoy the engine, I like a lot of games, and this one is not bothering me enough. The concept of no longer pulling it out, the concept of no longer playing it, just doesn't disturb me enough compared to the fact that it really is a solid game. From there we go to Ticket to Ride First Journey, which goes away because, I mean, frankly, the reasons on this one's pretty simple. Uh, this is a kid's game. Uh, it's one that my children enjoy playing to some extent. And my children, uh, when they, when we haven't played a game in a long time, which we have a lot of kids' games, and, and it's pretty simple. The rule is very, very simple for, for the, the kids' games in my family. When they haven't played a game in a long time, I ask them, can I get rid of this game? And if they say no, I don't. And if they don't seem to mind, I do. And Ticket to Ride, they, they don't seem to mind. They, we have a lot of kids games that have really been, they've really been enjoying. So lots of new ones recently we've added to the collection as well. And, and so this one is a solid, solid game. It's Ticket to Ride. They enjoy it. They like it. They don't love it enough. I think my daughter likes it the most, but the other two still need help with, uh, the locations and the tickets and the strategy of the game. And there are better sequencing games out there, in my opinion. And honestly, it's how I feel about Ticket to Ride as well. I feel Ticket to Ride as a series is generally a very solid series to get into, a very solid series to play, to be aware of or whatnot. But ultimately, it's not one that has stayed in my collection either for the same reason. It, it is a solid, sequential game that has you doing things, but ultimately it doesn't feel as rewarding as I would like while being surface level, appealing, good, etc., all those things. Next up is going to be, well, there's two more big ones here. So next up, we're going to go with Pandemic. And this is going to be everything in a broken token crate. Absolutely all the expansions, everything else, all the boards, all the deluxified, everything you can get in this. I mean, it's pretty cool, actually. This broken token crate has absolutely everything, sleeved cards, all the stuff, because it's Pandemic, and Pandemic is awesome. And also... Don't really pull this one out and play. I just don't. It's one that I talked about it a few months ago when I did a video talking about the, the first games that we got, the first games that I acquired and which ones are still in the collection. And I talked about this crate and I referenced the fact that it may well one day go away because we just don't play it. Now, we play Pandemic Legacy a lot. Pandemic Legacy, we've gone through season one twice season two twice. We are going to be getting our hands in season zero shortly to try that one. We may well go through season zero again. They say they're not making any more pandemic legacies. And if they don't, fine. If they do, we'll get those too. Because at the end of the day, I mean, these things sell. So people sometimes change their minds when about, I mean, I don't know if you were around for this, but do you remember when Dominion said this is going to be our last expansion? That didn't last very long. So we'll see how it goes with pandemic. Uh, pandemic is a solid cooperative game it is one of the staples in the hobby and it's one that i constantly recommend it's not the reason i'm getting rid of this one is just because we've played pandemic so 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 much we've had this game since 2012 we have played this game i don't want to say hundreds of times but it might have been a hundred plus times i don't know it's been a long we've had this for a long time and played it a lot but ever since really experiencing the pandemic legacy system we pull out pandemic incredibly infrequently because Pandemic Legacy just makes regular Pandemic feel like an inferior version of Pandemic Legacy. It's it's Pandemic Legacy without the story, without the unlocking, without the things that make Pandemic Legacy so much fun to go through. And while it's still a solid system, we can't help but play this without feeling that we'd rather be playing a Legacy game. There are other cooperative games that do a solid job and don't give me that ex that basically degrees of overlap that make me prefer one over the other. Horrified is a great example. Horrified is a game that I don't know if it'll stay in my collection forever either because it is on the lighter side and it's enjoyable, but on the lighter side. But there are a lot of solid, accessible, cooperative games that are fun to pull out that rely on a basic system of gen general cooperative games or whatnot 
but Pandemic is a solid one. It's great. I do recommend most of the expansions. I'm pretty sure I played with most of them. I've played with uh, On the Brink. I've played with the In the Lab. I don't know if I've played with the other one, the Emergency something or others. I don't know if I've added that. And there are a million Pandemic knockoffs or variants of Pandemic, and I'm almost tempted to get one of those. I've heard a lot of good things about Fall of Rome, and I do potentially want to try that out with the... It, with the assumption that even if I get it, I don't think it'll stay in my collection, but I enjoy the different experiences of trying out what Pandemic has to offer. It is a it's a staple in the hobby. It has done incredibly well. Surprisingly enough, or not surprisingly enough, it has done even better because of COVID. It's suddenly this concept of walking around the map and trying to restrict the flow of diseases. Once an abstract concept that, you know, just felt like, you know, simulating a war, suddenly has very real consequences, very real realism to our life it's suddenly the idea of trying to close off a disease is something that we're now we now understand the idea of trying to squeeze the areas that you know get rid of it before it spreads and then seeing flare-ups in locations where it was strong those are real concepts to us now and so pandemic is only gonna i mean it's only done better in the pot not popularity it's only done better because of the because of covid and how it has basically taken over our lives of the world and everything else solid game an incredibly fond part of my hobby, my collection, uh, very much for what Catan is for a lot of people. Pandemic is going to be for me. It's going to be, it's, Catan was my, my gateway to the hobby as well, don't get me wrong. But Pandemic was in the very first batch of games I bought, and it has lasted a very, very, very long time. And it is sad to see it go. And then from there, this one is, the next one is also pretty sad, but just an issue of time, attention, and all that, is going to be twofold. It's going to be 1775 and 1754. Now, these are both games in the same series. They're both both effectively 1754 I haven't actually played. I got it because of how much I liked 1755. That's why I got 17. Let me just reorganize these games here. But yeah, I got 1754 because of how much I liked 1755. 1775. And this is going to be an Academy Games uh, war game simulation. Let's see. Uh, this box is going to shift all over the place. There we go. Nothing at all fell out or whatever. This is going to be a two-player or four-player head-to-head war game that is very dry in its implementation. And reading the rules, it, it feels like there's not really a lot of game there, but there does manage to be a decent amount of game in this box. Okay, 1775, and this is going to be, I think the original game was 1812, then they have 1775, then they have 1754, then they have 878 Vikings. I don't know if they have any subsequently since then. But 1775 is one that... The core concept is you're putting down cubes on the map, taking over locations, spawning cubes into those areas, utilizing different action cards to take moves, to start battles, to occasionally do abilities, all those things triggering a, a, what effectively is a area control game that will continue for a variable number of rounds, minimum three rounds, but then after that until an end game state is achieved with you having enough control or whatnot. And so it is a lot of fun. It's a game that I first read the rules a long time ago. I thought to myself, it's like two pages of rules, maybe four pages of rules. I thought to myself that I don't understand what the game is here. It basically seems like draw a cube from a bag, roll dice. How is there a game here? And yet there is a game here. There really is a solid game of, of controlling key points. And it's not hidden behind powers and abilities and all these things that I tend to like in games. It's not hidden behind a tableau of powers that you can buy in Kemet, a bunch of cards you're drafting as in Blood Rage, uh, more drafting as in Innis. There's so many other games I have in area control that provide powers and abilities and other things in the game. And this does have cards. But the card play is simple and elegant. It is very, very simple and refined in the system it's doing. It's all about controlling key parts of the board at the right time, controlling spots you can generate more units into, taking the turns in the order and sequencing that works for you, that you can sit there and plan that I don't know if the British are going next or the Americans are going next, so I will take this sequence of actions because maybe we can result in board control by the end of the game. It's incredibly rewarding in the strategy that it provides, and yet I'm getting rid of it for two reasons. The first is... While I respect the fact that it is a cleaner game, a more elegant system, and that might make it a better choice for many people, ultimately I like the powers and abilities, as, as you may have noticed by watching my channel over, over the past year. I like, I like powers and abilities in games, I like Chaos in the Old World, I like Cthulhu Wars, I like Blood Rage, I like Kemet, I like Cyclades, I like all these games, but I specifically like them because of the level of power and abilities they bring to the table. If I want an abstract game, I'll play an abstract game. If I'm going to sit down for two hours to play an area control game, I want more brought to the table. I don't want balance and refinement. I want fun. And, and to me, those powers and abilities are more fun. Do not get me wrong. 
This game is fun. It stayed in my collection for quite some time, and I have pulled it out a lot. It just, it doesn't compete with the likes of those other games, at least for myself. And the second reason is going to tie into that reason, which is this game really requires it to be a two or four player game. And practically speaking, if I'm going to play a two player game, I much prefer games like Antique Duellum if I want an area control two player game. I have never played this one too, and I don't think I'd want to play it at two. I'm sure it would do well at two, but for me, the most fun of this game is when you're sitting there with your teammate planning tactically, where are we going to spawn troops? Where are we going to take movements? The, the collaboration is the redeeming factor that makes up for the lack of powers and abilities in this game, at least for myself. So why am I getting rid of it then if it does do that? The answer is basically it doesn't, it's very rare that it hits the table because of the groupings of people that have played it or will play it. It specifically requires exactly four players. And those four players, ideally, you want a balance of uh, either both people having all four players having played it, or at least one having played, two having played it, so you can line up two teams, one who knows it, one doesn't. The problem there is that when that happens, that first game inevitably feels a bit frustrating as the people who know how to play the game have to sit there and restrict themselves from alpha gaming the other player because you are, it's a, it's a balance. You have to guide your teammate about things they don't know. And yet, if by doing so, you're effectively taking control. And so we found that it is hard to bring new people into the fold for this game because of that balance. And when it's down to just having four people who have played it, it very rarely happens. And so in the past, like, three years, I've played this game, I think, three times, which is is fine. It's just it's very hard to justify keeping it on my shelf if it's not going to see play in comparison with the other area control games that I enjoy, love, etc. And so that's it, or... Almost it, as the case may be, because if you noticed any jump cut there, it's because I realized at the last minute that I forgot a game, which is kind of a big deal, specifically because of the game that I forgot. And so, let's just clear the table, as it were, because we will need to clear the table. And let's just get all these guys off. So, as I was finishing up, I realized that there was one game that I forgot to add to the table, add to the list of games I'm getting rid of, and it's one that I've actually gotten multiple questions on and have told people that I will talk about it today, and that's because it's two gigantic huge boxes that are leaving my collection, sadly. And that's going to be, oh, Bloodborne Box 1 by Come On. It's going to be Bloodborne Box 1 and Bloodborne Box 2. And honestly, it feels like the echo here is going to be a little problematic, so let's just leave that here and here. And so why why am I getting rid of these games before before they even leave the packages? And, and I'm not bothering to do an unboxing, I'm not bothering to do a review, because I don't think it's fair to the game, well, a few things. The unboxing is because, I, I, I mean, frankly speaking, I plan on selling this at this point, and I don't want to sit there and unbox it all, so I can then open a used game just for the sake of an unboxing video. And the review is going to be because it's not fair to the game to review it, given the reasons I'm getting rid of. Now, I don't mind talking about it in this video, explaining what's leaving my collection and why, but a full dedicated review I don't think would be fair to the game. So Bloodborne is a game that I had the opportunity to play with Kaman, to play with uh, Michael Chanel, in fact, the designer, on TTS. And that one game simultaneously gave me a clear idea that Bloodborne is a game that is not for me, but may well be for you. Because the reason I'm getting rid of Bloodborne, the reason Bloodborne is uh, leaving my collection, leaving my shelf and not entering my collection, is because it's too true to the video game. Now, I am someone who was never a fan of the video game of Bloodborne. I didn't enjoy it, but I assumed, foolishly, perhaps, that a board game would be different, that a board game wouldn't be as punishing or as exacting as the video game is. I am someone who likes powers, abilities, and things, and stuff to do, and killing, slaughtering others. I don't mind slaughtering others in games, not in real life, obviously. Now, I don't mind the tactical nature of a Gloomhaven. I don't mind the process of min-maxing your way to a perfect game to try to figure out how to win. But you're still, you still feel powerful, you still feel in control. And when I played Bloodborne on TTS, granted only one play, keep that in mind, very much only one play. But when I played Bloodborne on TTS, it felt to me like a game where the mission mattered far more and running and being on your toes was a factor in the game. It wasn't as simple as getting weapons and powers and abilities and killing bad guys along the way. And it wasn't even the tactical side of Gloomhaven where you still get to kill bad guys along the way, but it's more tactical and less run and gun. Bloodborne at its core felt like the mission mattered, and then you had to be very precise in what time you could allocate 
towards all the other things because there is a clock in the game. There's a clock that keeps the game moving and a progression. And then as you go through these steps, you're unlocking different missions and different scenarios or different ways to, to earn what you need to progress your way through the mission. But the combat in the game felt like an exercise in managing what you need to do. And it didn't feel like the game was about the combat. It felt like the game was about winning and the combat was a secondary side thing to kind of manage along the way. Which again, to me, is how the video game felt. I never liked the video game because I didn't like running through mobs of creatures and not fighting them. That is antithetical to what I'm looking for in a video game with monsters and weapons. And I didn't like the fact that when you did encounter monsters, it was incredibly precise and tactical in the exact back and forth you had to engage with in order to actually win that battle. Which again, is a perfect match to the video game, to, to the board game. So they really did a solid job implementing the board game and the video game all at once. And, and I made the mistake of assuming the board game would be different. And so that's why Bloodborne is going to be leaving my collection. It's, I'm simultaneously sad because I was looking forward to this one. The miniatures, the, I generally like command games. Everything about this was, I, I read almost every single designer diary along the way and I thought this would work for me. And so I'm sad, but also I'm happy because it means that this is one less gigantic big box Kickstarter that I have to find room to put on my shelf and time to play. So you win some, you lose some, or in this case, uh, it's a, it's a win-win, but it's just, this won't be a command game that gets added to my collection. There's still hope. I still backed Zombicide season two and everything all in. So I still got plenty of plastic headed my way. Just, just this one won't make it. And that's going to be a wrap. A whole bunch of, uh, nine smaller games and then, these two gigantic boxes that dwarf everything else in terms of in terms of the shelf space I am clearing up this month. Uh, basically, that's it. I will see you next month, uh, next February, with, you know, what's leaving the collection in February. And, of course, I'll see you a whole bunch more times along the way with all the daily videos and everything else. And until next time, I'm Alex Radcliffe from Board Game Co., and I hope you have a good one.